the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Okay, hello everyone. I'm John Furrier with the Cube. We're here with uh, Meet the Analyst segment Sunday morning. We got everyone around the world here to discuss really the news around the the, the uh, EU killing the privacy shield or striking it down, among other topics around. You know, data, privacy, and global commerce. We've got a great guest here, Ray Wong, CEO of Constellation Research, Bill Mu, founder and CEO of Cyber Crisis Management from the firm Crisis Team, and uh, JD, CEO of Spearhead Management. JD, I can let you say your name because I really can't pronounce it. Uh, how do I how does it pronounce it? Doctor? I, I wouldn't even try it unless you are Dutch, otherwise it will seriously hurt your throat. So JD, it <laughs> works perfect for me. Dr. Dukag. And Sabi Chowal, who's obviously influencer, a cloud awesome native expert. Great guys, great to have you on, appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And Bill, thank you for initiating this. I, I appreciate all your tweets. Happy Sunday. You guys have been really <laughs> tweeting up a storm. I want to get everyone together kind of as an analyst, meet the analyst segment. Let's go through it. The news is the EU, and U.S. privacy shield for data struck down by the court. That's the BBC headline, variety of news, different perspectives. you got an American perspective and you got an international perspective. Bill, we'll start with you. What does this news mean? I mean, basically half the people in the world probably don't even know what the privacy shield means. So why, what is the, why is this ruling so important and what, why is, should it be discussed? Well, uh, data sharing between Europe and America is based on a, 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 a two-way promise that when data goes from Europe to America, the Americans promise to respect our privacy. And when data goes from America to Europe, the Europeans uh, promise to respect the American privacy. Uh, unfortunately, there are big cultural differences between the two blocks. Uh, the Europeans have a massive orientation around privacy as a, uh, a human right. Uh, and in the US, there's somewhat more of a, uh, a prioritization on national security. Um, and therefore, for some time, there's been a mismatch here. And it could be argued that the Americans haven't been living up to their promise because they've had various different laws. And we'll come on to talk about FISA and the Cloud Act that actually contravene um, European privacy and make are incompatible with the promise that the Americans have given. That promise, first of all, was in the form of a treaty called Safe Harbor. This went to court and was struck down. It was replaced by Privacy Shield, um, which was pretty much the same thing, really. Um, and that has recently been caught to court as well. And that has been struck down. Um, there now is no other means of legally sharing data between Europe and America other than what have been called standard contractual clauses. This isn't a broad uh, um, treaty between two nations. These are drawn up by each, each individual country. But also in the ruling, they said that standard contractual clauses could not be used by any companies that were subject to mass surveillance. And actually, in the US, the FISA courts um, uh, enforce a level of mass surveillance through all of the major IT firms, so all major US telcos, cloud firms, or indeed um, uh, social media firms. So this means that for all of the companies out there and their clients, um, uh, business should be carrying on as usual, apart from if you're one of those major uh, US IT firms or one of their clients. So why, I mean, why is this, why did this come about? Was there like a major incident? Why now? What's the court? Was it in the court, stuck in the courts? Were people bitching and moaning about it? What's the, why did this go down? What's okay. the real issue? For those of us who have been following this uh, uh, attentively, um, <laughs> things have been getting more and more precarious for a number of years now. Um, we've had a, a situation where um, the different measures have been taken in the U.S. that have continued to erode uh, the different protections that there were uh, for Europeans. Uh, FISA is a, 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 an example that I've given, and that is the sort of uh, secret uh, courts and secret warrants that are issued to seize data without anyone's knowledge. There's the Cloud Act, which is a sort of extra judicial um, uh, uh, law that means that um, warrants can be served in America um, to US organizations and they have to hand over data wherever that data resides, anywhere in the world. So data could exist on a European server if it was under the control of an American company, um, they'd have to uh, ha um, hand that over. So 
whilst Pfizer is in direct con co conflict with the promises that the Americans made, um, things like uh, the Cloud Act are not only in controversy with the promise they've made, there's conflicting law here, because if you're the, uh, a, a US subsidiary of um, a, a big US firm and you're based in Europe, who do you obey? The, the European law that says you can't hand it over because of GDPR, or the American law so uh, that says they've got extra judicial control and that you've got to hand it over. So it's it's made things a complete mess. And to say, has this has suddenly happened? No, there's been a gradual erosion, and this has been going through the courts for a number of years, and many of us have seen it coming, and now it just hits us. So if I get you right, what you're saying is it's, it's basically this all this mishmash of different laws and there's no coherency and consistency? Is that the core well, issue? On, on the European side, you could argue there's quite a lot of consistency because we uphold people's privacy, um, in theory. Um, uh, that There have been odd incidents, which we could talk about with that, but in theory they're, they're, that we uphold uh, your rights, dear, and uh, also the rights of Europeans. So everyone's data should be safe here from the sort of mass surveillance we're seeing. In the right. US, there's more of a direct conflict between uh, everything, including there's been a, a, a in his first week in the White House, Donald Trump signed an executive order saying that the, the Privacy Act in the US, which had been the main protection for people in the US, no longer applied to non-US citizens, which was if, if you wanted to try and cause a storm and if you wanted to try and undermine the treaty, there's no better way than doing it than that. A lot of ways, Ray, I mean, simplify this for me because I'm a startup, I'm hustling, or I'm a big company. I don't even know who runs the servers anymore. And I got data stored in multiple clouds. I got in regions and Oracle just announced more regions. You got Amazon, a gazillion regions. I could be on premise. I mean, bottom line, what is this about? I mean, and- Well, Bill's and right. I mean, when Max Schrems, American the company. Austrian- Bill's right. When Max Schrems, the Austrian activist, actually filed his uh, case against Facebook for where data was being stored, data residency wasn't as popular. Um, and, you know, what it means for companies that are in the cloud is that you have to make sure your data is being stored in the region and following those specific region rules. Um, you can't skirt those rules anymore. And I think the cloud companies know that this has been coming for some time. And that's why there's been announcement in a lot of regions, a lot of areas that are actually happening. Um, so I think that's the important part. But but going back to Bill's earlier point, which is important, is the America, America is basically the Canary Islands of privacy, right? Privacy is there, but it isn't there in a very, very explicit sense. Uh, and I think we've been skirting the rules for quite some time because a lot of our economy depends on that data and the marketing of that data. And so we often confuse privacy with consent and also with value exchange. And I think that's part of the problem of what's going on here. Companies that have been building their business models on free data, free private data, free personally identifiable information um, are, are the ones that are at risk. And, and I think that's what's going on here. It's the classic Facebook is you're the product there and the data is your product. Um, well, I want to get into um, what this means because my, my personal takeaway is not knowing, not knowing the specifics is and just following, say, cybersecurity, for instance. One of the tenants there is that data sharing is a valuable, um, important uh, ethos in the community. Now, everyone has their own privacy or uh, security data and they don't want to let everyone know about their exploits. But it's well known in the security world that sharing data with each other, different companies and countries, is actually a good thing. So the question that comes in my mind, is this really about data sharing or data privacy or both? I think it's about both. Uh, and actually what the, the ruling is saying here is all we're asking from the European side is please stop spying on us and please give us a, a level of equal protection that you give to your own citizen. Because data comes that comes from America to Europe if that, that data um, belongs to a US citizen or a European citizen, it's given equal protection. It is only if data goes in the other direction where you have secret courts, secret warrants, seizure of data on this massive scale, and also a level of lack of equivalence that, is, that has been imposed. Um, and, and we're just asking that once you've, once you've sorted out a few of those things, we're saying everything's back on the table. Away we go again. Why don't we merge the EU the with the United States? Wouldn't that solve the problem? <laughs> we just left Europe. <laughs> I, 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 actually, I the always take takeover of the UK, maybe the 52nd state. I always pick on Bill. Like, Bill, you, you guys are screaming loud and clear about all these concerns, but UK is trying to get, off the, get out of that economic union. It is a union at the end of the day. And I think the problem is the institutional 
mismatch between EU and US. US is old democracy, bigger country population wise, bigger economy. Whereas Europe is set of countries trying to put together, band together as one entity and the institutions are new, like, you know, they're 15 years old, right? They're maturing. Yeah. I think that's where the big mismatch is. And well, Ray, I want to get your thoughts on this. Ray wrote a book, I forget what year it was, this digital disruption. Basically, it was basically digital transformation before it was actually a trend. And, you know, if what's, I mean, to me, it's like, do you do the process first and then figure out where the value extraction is? And, and you know, this may be a Silicon Valley or an American thing, but go create value, then figure out how to uh, create process or, or understand regulation. So if data and entrepreneurship is, a, is going to be a new modern era of value, why wouldn't we want to create a rule-based system that's open and enabling and not restricted? So it gets a great point, right? And it's, look, the innovation culture means you go do it first and you figure out the rules later. And, and that's been a very American way of getting things done and a very Silicon Valley uh, perspective. Not everyone, but I think it's in general, that's kind of the trend. I, I think the challenge here is that we are trading privacy for security, privacy for convenience, privacy for personalization, right? And on the security level, it's a very different conversation than what it is on the consumer and pro, you know, personalization side. Um, on the security side, I think most Americans are okay with a little bit of spying, at least on your own side. Uh, you know, to keep the country safe. We're not okay with a China level type of spying, uh, which we're not sure exactly what that means or what's enforceable in the courts. Um, we look like China to the Europeans in the way we treat privacy. Uh, just, and, and I think that's the perspective we need to understand because the Europeans are very explicit about how privacy is, is being uh, protected. And so this really comes back to a point where we actually have to get to a consent model on privacy as to knowing what data is being shared, you have the right to say no, and when do you have the right to say no? Uh, and then if you have a value exchange on that uh, data, uh, then it's really like sometimes it's monetary, sometimes it's non-monetary, sometimes there's other areas around consensus where you can actually put that into place. Uh, and, and I think that's what's missing at this point saying, you know, do we pay for your data? Do we explicitly get your consent first before we use it? Uh, and we haven't had that in place. And I think that's where we're headed towards. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we have to say privacy should be a human right. It is in the UN charter, uh, but we haven't figured out how to enforce it or talk about it in a digital age. And, and so I think that's the challenge. Hey, okay. people, until, until they lose it, they, they don't really understand what it means. I mean, look, look at Americans, not to say that we're, we're idiots on this front, but you know, the thing is, is most people don't even understand how much value is getting sucked out of their digital exhaust, our, our kids, TikTok and whatnot. So, I mean, I get that. And I think there's some, there's going to be a blowback for America for sure. I just worry it's going to increase the cost of doing business and 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 take away from the innovation for citizen value, the people. Because at the end of the day, it's for the people, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, what's my privacy mean? If uh, I lose I, value. I even, even before we we start talking about the value of the data and the innovation that we can do through through data use, you have to understand the European perspective here. For the European, there, there's a level of double standards and an erosion of trust. Um, there's, there's double standards in the fact that um, in California, you have new privacy regulations that are, are slightly different to GDPR, but they're very much GDPR like. Um, and if it was the boot was on the other foot to say if we were spying on Californians and looking at their personal data and contravening CCPA, the Californians would be up in arms. Likewise, if we, having promised to have a level of equality, had enacted a local rule in Europe, said that when data from America is over here, actually, the privacy of Americans counts for nothing. We're only going to prioritize the privacy of Europeans. Again, the Americans would be up in arms. And therefore, you can see that there are real double standards here that are a massive issue. And until those are addressed, um, we're not going to trust the Americans. And likewise, the very fact that and on a number of occasions, Americans have signed up to treaties and promised to protect our data as they did with Safe Harbor, as they did with Privacy Shield, and then have blatantly, blatantly failed to do so it means that actually to get back to even a level playing field where we were, you have a great deal to trust, of trust to overcome. And the, the thing from the perspective of the big IT firms, they've seen this coming for a long time. As, as Ray was saying, and they've sought to try and have a presence in Europe and other things. But the way that this ruling has gone is that I'm sorry, that isn't going to be sufficient. 
these big IT firms based in the US that have been happy to hand over data, well, some of them are more happy than others, but they all need to hand over data to the NSA or the CIA. They've been doing this um, for some time now um, without actually respecting this pr data privacy agreement that has existed between the two trading blocks. And now they've been called out and they've, uh, the position now is that the US is no longer trusted and neither are any of these large um, American technology firms. And until the, um, uh, uh, the snooping stops and, and equality is introduced, they can now no longer, even from their European operations, they can no longer um, use uh, uh, standard contractual clauses to, to transfer data, which is going to be a massive restriction on their business. And if they had any sense, they'd be lobbying very, very hard right now to the Senate, um, to the House, to try and persuade US lawmakers actually to stick to some of these treaties, yeah. to stop introducing really mad laws that ride, ride roughshod over other people's privacy and have us on a certain amount of respect. Let's let JD weigh in because he just got in. Sorry on the video, I made him back on the host because he dropped off. Just real, Bill, real quick. I mean, I think it's like when, you know, when I go to Europe, there's a line for Americans and there's a line for EU or EU and everybody else. I mean, we might be there, but ultimately it, it, this has to be solved. So JD, I want to let you weigh in. Germany has been at the beginning forefront of privacy and They've been well, hardcore. And how, how's this all playing out from your perspective? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that in Germany, there is a very strong love for regulation. Germans panic as soon as there's no regulation. So they need to understand what am I allowed to do and what I'm, am I not allowed to do. And they expect the same from the others. From, for the record, I'm not German, but I live in Germany for some 20 years. So I got a bit of a feeling for that. And that sense of need for regulation has spread very fast throughout the European Union because most of the European member states of the European Union considered this that it, that it uh, makes sense. And then we found that Britain had already a very good framework for privacy. So GDPR itself yeah. is very largely based on what the United Kingdom already had in place with their Privacy Act. Moving forward, we try to find agreement and consensus with other countries, especially the United States, because that's where most of the tech providers are, only to find out, and that is where it started to go really, really bad, 2014, when the mass production by Edward Snowden came out, to find out it's not just data from citizens, it's surveillance, surveillance programs, which include companies. I joined a purchasing conference a few weeks ago where the per of a large European multinational where the uh, purchasing director explicitly stated that the usage of US-based tech providers for sensitive data is prohibited as a result of them finding out that they have been under surveillance. So it's not just the citizens. There is no, mass... There you have it, guys. We did trust you. We did have agreements there that you could have abided by, but you chose not to. You chose to abuse our trust, and you're now in a position where you are no longer trusted. And unless you can lobby uh, your own uh, uh, elected representatives to actually um, uh, recreate a level playing field, we're not going to continue trusting you. So well, I, I mean, that, like, you know, I don't, I don't... You know, innovation has to come from somewhere, and you know has to come from America. If that's the case, you guys have to get, get on board, right? Is that what it is? Uh, innovation is that the without trust? <laughs> is that the perspective? I, I, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's a country thing. I mean, like, you know, it's not you <laughs> I'm or just them. I think everybody, no, no, but, but I think everybody, everybody does, um, everybody is looking for what the privacy rules are and what's important. And um, you can have that innovation with consent. And, and I think that's really where we're gonna get to. And this is why I keep pushing that issue. Um, I mean, privacy should be a fundamental right and how you get paid for that privacy is interesting um, or how you get compensated for that privacy if you know what these explicit value exchange is. What you're talking about here is the surveillance that's going on by companies, which shouldn't be happening. Right. That that's a you know, that shouldn't be happening at the company level. At the government level, I can understand that that is happening. And I think those are treaties that the governments have to agree upon uh, as to how much 
they're going to impinge on our personal privacy for the trade-off for security. And, and I don't think they've had those discussions either, or they decided and didn't tell any of their citizens. And, and I think that's probably more likely yeah. the case. I mean, I think what's happening here, Bill, you guys are pointing out, Ray, you articulated there on the other side, as I'm in my kind of colorful joke aside, is that we're living a first generation modern sociology problem. I mean, this is a policy challenge that extends across multiple industries, cybersecurity, citizens' yeah. rights, uh, geopolitical. I mean, when we were looking, even when we were doing CUBE events overseas in Europe and um, uh, in nation, North American companies were going abroad, they were just recycling the American program. And we found there's so much localization value. So Ray, this is this is the digital disruption. It's the, it's the, it's the virtualization of physical for digital worlds. And, no, and it's a lot of network theory, which is computer science, a lot of sociology. This is mo yeah. this is a modern challenge, and I don't think it's so much as a silver bullet. It's just that we need smart people working on this. That's my takeaway. But you know, I, I, think, I think we can we can describe the ideal endpoint being somewhere where we have meaningful protection alongside the maximization of economic and social value through innovation. So that that should be what we would all agree would be the ideal endpoint. But we need both. We need meaningful protection. And we need the maximization of economic and social value through innovation. Well, I feel add another access. I I'll add another access security as well. Security. Well, I, feel I, I put meaningful protection as both covering both security and privacy. Well, I'll speak for the American perspective here, and I won't speak because I'm not the president of the United States. But I will say, as someone who's been from Silicon Valley and the East Coast, as a technical person, not a political person. Our lawmakers are idiots when it comes to tech, just generally. They're not really. <laughs> they savvy. really don't understand. Okay. They really don't understand the tech so, at all. So, so the I'm problem not is. are a great deal better. Well, well, this is where I think this is a modern problem. Like the young people that I talk to are like, why do we have these rules? What, they're all lawyers that got into these positions of Congress and the American side. And so with the American Jedi contract, you guys have been following very closely is. It's been like the old school Oracle, IBM, and then Amazon was leading with an innovative solution and Microsoft has come in and repivoted. And so what you have is a fight for the digital future of citizenship. And I think what's happening is, is that we're in a massive societal transition where the people in charge don't know what the hell they're talking about technically. And they don't know who to tap to solve the problems or even shape or frame the problems. Now there's pockets of people that are working on it, but to me as someone who looks at this saying, it's a pretty simple solution. It's, no one's ever seen this before. So this metaphor you can draw, but it's a completely different problem space because it's physical, yeah, digital. Data we, we've involved. got a lot of lobbyists out there and we've got some tech firms spending an enormous amount on lobbying. If those lobbyists aren't trying to steer their representatives in the right direction to come up with laws that aren't going to massively undermine trade and, and, and data sharing between Europe and America, then they're making a big mistake. Because uh, we got here through some really dumb uh, lawmaking in the US. It, I mean, w there are none of the laws in Europe that are a problem here because GDPR isn't a great difference. You're a great deal different from some of the laws that we have already in California and elsewhere. The no, laws Bill, are at issue Bill, here. Bill, Bill, you have to like back off a little bit from the rhetoric that, that EU is perfect and US is not. That's not true. I'm not I saying think. we're perfect. No, no, I, no you I say that all the time. A lack no, of no, you say that all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, no, I, I hear that all the time. wrestle. That's yes, your, yes. Your, Come on. I, when, no, I'm, no. when I'm being critical of some of the dumb laws in the US, I'm not <laughs> saying Europe's perfect. Uh, what I'm we're trying to say is that in this particular instance, I, I said there was an equal balance here between meaningful protection and the maximization of economic and social value. On the meaningful protection side, America's got it very wrong in terms of the meaningful protection it provides to certainly European data. On the maximization of economic and social value, I think Europe's got it wrong. I think there are a lot of things that we could do in Europe to actually um, have far more innovation. Yeah, it's a cultural I, I think, issue. If the Germans want rules, that's what they crave for. America's the other way. We don't want rules. I mean, pretty much it's a rebel society. Um, and uh, that's kind of the, the ethos of most tech companies. But I think, you know, to me, the media, there's two things that go on with, with this tech business. The companies themselves have to be checked by, say, government. And I'm, I believe in not a lot of regulation, but enough to check the power of bad actors. Media, so-called checking power, both of these major uh, roles, they don't really know what they're talking about. And this is back to the education piece. The people who are in the media, so-called checking power, and the government checking power, assume that 
the companies are bad, right? So yeah, if there's a, you know eight out of ten companies like Amazon or other are actually try to do good things, if you don't know what good is, you don't really you know you're in the wrong game. So I think media and government have a huge education uh, opportunity to look at this because they they don't even know what they're measuring. I, th- I, I think that we are unreeling. I think we're unreeling from the globalization. Like we are undoing the globalization and that these are the side effects. These conflicts are a side effect of that. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is I support the focus on innovation in America and that has driven an enormous amount of, uh, of wealth and, uh, and value. Um, what I'm questioning here is, do you really need to spy on us, your allies, in order to help that innovation. And, and I'm starting to, I mean, do you need mass surveillance of your allies? I mean, I can, I can see you, you may want to, to have some uh, uh, surveillance of people who are a threat to you, but we, we're guys, we're meant to be on your side and you're not, you haven't been um, treating our privacy with a great deal of respect. You know, Saudi Arabia was our ally. You know, 9-11 happened because of them, their people, right? There's no ally here and there's no enemy in a way. We don't know where the rogue actors are sitting. Like we and don't know. Okay. The, the they can be state, within the US. Well, it's well understood. As I agree. Sorry, it's well understood that na- uh, nation states are enabling terrorist groups to take out cyber attacks. That's well well known. Oh, Open that's... source enables it. So I think there's there's the there's the. I'm not sure privacy, you're accusing privacy the Europeans versus... of doing this though. No, no. Well, I mean, but, I, you know, the data I, share. I, 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 I'm a former officer in the Royal Navy. I, I've stood shoulder to shoulder with my U.S. counterparts. I put my life on the line as a, as a, on NATO um, exercises in real war zones. And I'm now a, a disabled ex-serviceman as a result of that. Um, I, I mean, if I put my life on the I line, would... shoulder to shoulder with Americans, why yeah. is my privacy not respected? Uh, oh, I'm not, hold on. Bill, I, Bill, I, Bill, Bill, I was going to say, actually, that it's it's not that. Like, even in the U.S., right, the part of the spying internally is we have internal actors that are yeah. behaving poorly, right? Just we have Marxist organizations posing as, you know, uh, whatever it is. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But my point being is we've got a lot of that. Every country has that. We have, every one country has actors and citizens and people in the system that are destined to try to overthrow the system. And I think that's what that surveillance is about. The question is, we don't have treaties or we didn't have very explicit agreements. And that's why I'm... I'm pushing really hard here, like they're separating privacy versus security, which is yes. the national yeah. security yes. and privacy versus us as citizens in terms of our data being um, basically taken over for free, being used for free. I right? and, and I think that's yeah. that, that I think we have some agreement on. I just think that our governments haven't really had that conversation about what surveillance means. Maybe someone agreed and said, oh, okay, that's fine. You guys can go do that. We won't tell anybody. And that's that's what it feels like. And I don't think we deliberately are saying, hey, we're, we wanted to spy on your citizens. I think someone said, hey, there's a benefit here too. Otherwise, I don't think that you would have let this happen for that long unless Max had made that case and started this ball rolling. So, and, I totally and Edward support, Snowden and other folks. Yeah, and I totally I want to, I want to add to the security. I mean, we I, need, I we to... need to, whether, whether it's domestic terrorists, we need to stop them. And we need to have local action in UK to stop it happening here and in America to stop it happening there. But if we're doing that, there is absolutely no need for the Americans to be spying on us. And there's absolutely no need for the Americans to say that privacy uh, applies to US citizens only and not to Europeans. That's a fair point. These are dark. That's a fair These point. I'm sure GCHQ and everyone else has, has this covered. I mean, I'm sure they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Bill, I know we, for a fact. I've been involved in some, I, and I know for a fact the US and the UK are discussing, and I know um, a company called IronNet, which is run by General Keith Alexander, yeah. funded by C5 Capital. There's a lot of collaboration because. This is, again, they're trying to get their arms around how to frame it. And they all agree that sharing data for the security side is super important, right? And and I think IronNet has this thing called Iron Dome, which is essentially like, they're saying, hey, we'll just get consistency around the rules and share data. And we can both, everyone can have their own little data. So I think that there's recognition at the highest levels of some smart people in both countries that, hey, yeah. let's go, let's work together. The issue I have is just policy. And I think there's a lot of clustering going on, cluster F here around just yeah. getting out of their own way. That's my are we a PG show. Wait, are we a PG show? I just got to remember that. <laughs> it's internet. There's no, regu- there's no rules. There's no regulation. Is it the European rules or is it the American rules? <laughs> I'd like to jump. I would like to jump back quickly to the purpose of the surveillance. Um, and especially when, when mass surveillance is, is done under the cover of national security and uh, terror prevention, 
I work with five clients in the past decade who all have been targeted under mass surveillance, which was revealed by Edward Snowden. And when they did their own investigation and partially was confirmed by Edward Snowden in person, they found out that their purchasing department, their engineering department, big parts of their pricing data was targeted in mass surveillance. There's no way that you, anyone can explain me that that has anything to do with preventing terror attacks or finding the bad guys. That is economical espionage. You cannot call it in any other way. And that was authorized by the same legislation that authorizes the surveillance for the right purposes. I'm all for fighting terror and anything that can help us prevent terror from happening, I would be the first person to welcome it. But I do not welcome when that regulation is abused yeah. for a lot of other things under the cover of national interest. This is I back, to the lawmakers. It's back to the lawmakers again. And again, I, I Amer America has been victim to the Chinese uh, sucking of intellectual property. It's well documented, well known in, yeah, in but, tech circles. But just because the Chinese have targeted you doesn't give you a uh, free reign to target us. I'm so not, sa I'm not can, saying that. But if it, the it, U.S. could sort out a little bit of reform in the, the Senate and the House, um, I think that would go a long way to solving the, the issues that Europeans have right now and a long way to sort of reaching a far better place from which we can all innovate and cooperate. Here's the challenge that I see. If you, if you, if you want to be instrumenting everything, you need to close society because if you have to, if you have a free country like America and the UK and democracy, you're open. If you're open, you can't stop everything, right? So you, there has to be a trust to your point, Bill. That's to me that I'm just, I just can't get my arms around that idea of complete lockdown and data surveillance because I don't think it's gettable in the United States. Like it's not a, it's a free world. It's like open. It should be open. Um, but yeah, we got the grids and we got the critical infrastructure that should be protected. So that's one hand. Um, I just can't get around that because once you start getting to locking down stuff and measuring everything, it's just a series of walled gardens. So yeah. to JD's point on the uh, procurement data and pricing data, I have been involved in some of those kind of operations. Uh, and I think it's financial espionage that they're looking at, financial security, trying to figure out where to track down capital flows and what was purchased. I hope that wasn't in the, your client's case, but I think it's trying to figure out where the money flow was going more so than trying to understand their pricing data from competitive purposes. If that is the latter, where they're stealing the competitive information on pricing and that data is getting back to a competitor, that is definitely a no-no. But if it's really to figure out where the money trail went, uh, which is what I think most of those financial uh, financial analysts are doing, especially in the CIA or in the FBI, that's that's really what that probably would have been. Yeah, I don't think the CIA is selling the data to your competitors as a company, you know, as a Microsoft or as a, or as a Google. They're not selling it to each other, right? They're not giving it to each other, right? So I think the one big problem I, I studied with, with FISA is that they get the data, but how long they can keep the data and how long they can mine the data. So they, they should use that data as exhaust, means like they use it and just throw it away, but they don't. They keep mining that data at a later date. Uh, and, and, and FISA is only good for five years. Like I learned that every five years we revisit that. And that's what happened um, this time that we renewed it for six years this time, not five for some reason, one extra year. So I think we revisit an our cycle. laws. Huh? Election could cycle. be an election cycle, maybe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, we revisit all these laws um, with Congress and Senate here uh, periodically just to make sure that they are up to date and they're not infringing with human rights or citizens' rights and stuff like that. Uh, when you say you update to check they're not um, are conflicting with them, did, did you not spot that it was conflicting with Privacy Shield and some of the promises you made to European? At what point did that bit, uh, fail to become obvious? It does. It does because there's a heightened urgency. Every big incident happens. 9-11 caused a lot of new sort of regulations and, and laws coming into the picture. And then the last time the, uh, the Russian interference in our elections, that created some high sort of heightened sort of urgency about like, we need to do something guys here. Like if some, some country can topple our elections, Right, uh, that's not acceptable. So, yeah. and what, we, what was it that your allies did that forced you to spy on us and and to, to downgrade our privacy? I and I, I'm not an expert on the political systems here. I think I think our allies are little okay. Lose on their and like okay, let's say like the. I call it village politics. Like world is like a village. Like it's only few countries. It's like it's not millions of countries, right? 
like it, it like that's how I see it the city versus village and then that's how I see the countries are there like village politics like there are two camps like there's Russia and China camp and then then there's U.S. camp on the other side. Like we used to have Russia and U.S. two forces, big big guys, and they manage the whole world balance somehow, right? Like some people are with, with one camp, the other are with the other, right? That's how they used to work. Now yeah, the Russia I, I, is gone. Hold on, let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah, Russia is gone. That there's a void, right? And the China's trying to fill that void. Chinese are not like like I think diplomat enough to fill that void. And there's it's all like we are in this imbalance. I believe. And then the, the Russia becomes a rogue actor kind of in a way that that's how I see it. And then they are funding all these kind of bad people. Uh, you, you, you see that all, all along, like what happens happened in the Middle East well, you, and all that stuff. And you what said there are different camps. We, we thought we were in your camp. We, 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 we didn't expect to be spied on by you or, no, no, or yeah. to have our, our rights downgraded by you. No, I understand, we but, your side. but but you guys, you guys have to trust us also. Like in village, let me tell you, I'm from a village. That's why I call we use the villager as a hashtag in my Twitter also. Like in village, there are usually one or two families which keep the village intact. That's how it works. Right. Like, maybe, I don't know if you have lived in a place or not. Oh, Bill, you're making some great statements. Where's the evidence on, on the surveillance? Can pe Where can people find more information on this? Can you share? Um, I, I think there's plenty of evidence, and I can send some stuff on. And, I, and, I, and I'm yeah. a little bit shocked, given the, the, the awareness of the FISA Act, the Cloud Act, the fact that these these things are in existence, and they're, they're not exactly unknown. Uh, and many um, people have been um, complaining about them for years. I mean, We've had safe harbor overturned. We've had privacy shield overturned, and these weren't just on a whim. Yeah. What does JD have in his hand? I want to know. Snowden. The Edward Snowden book. <laughs> book by, by Edward Snowden, um, which which gives you uh, plenty. But it was not, that, and that's something that we have to keep in mind because we can also uh, we can always claim that whatever Edward, Edward Snowden wrote that he made that up. Yeah. Every publication by Edward Snowden there's an avalanche of technical confirmation. One of the things that he described about the Cisco switches, which Bill uh, prefers to quote every time, which is a proven case, there were bundles of researchers saying, I told you guys, nobody paid attention to those researchers. And Edward Snowden was smart enough to get the mass media representation in that. But there's one thing, a question I have for, for Sabian, because in the, in the two parties strategy, it, it is interesting that you always take out the European Union as a partner. And the European Union is a big player and it will continue to grow. It has a growing amount of trade agreements with the growing amount of countries. And I still and I hope- think that, I think the number of countries is reducing. We've just, you've just lost one. Well, only one. And actually <laughs> those, those, are four, those are four countries under one kingdom, but that's another point. <laughs> right, guys, final topic, 5G impact. Because um, you mentioned Cisco, couldn't help let me, think let about- me, Let me finish please my, okay. my question, uh, John. Okay, go ahead. How would the United States respond if the European Union would now legalize to spy on everybody and every company and every governmental institution within the United States and say, no, no, that's our privilege. We need that. How would the United States respond? You can try that and see what economically what happens to you. That's how the village politics work. You have to listen to the, the mightier than you. And we are economically mighty. That's the fact. Actually, it's hard to swallow fact for if you guys for built, anybody if you else. Built a great, if you guys built a great app, I would use it and surveil all you want. Yeah, but so this yeah. is going to be yeah, driven exactly. by the economics. Because <laughs> exactly the that, exactly cloud, what John said. Yeah. Now, this is going to be driven by the economics here. The big US cloud firms are going to find this ruling enormously difficult for yeah. them. And they are inevitably going to um, lobby for a level of reform. And I think a level of reform is needed. No, nobody uh, uh, on your side is, is actually arguing very vociferously that the Cloud Act and the, and the discrimination against Europeans is actually a particularly good idea. The problem is that once you've done the reform, um, are we going to believe you when you say, oh, it's all good now, we've stopped it? Because the, like, with the crypto AG scandal in Switzerland, you weren't exactly honest about what you were doing. With the FISA court, so I mean, these are secret courts of secret warrants. How do we know, and and what proof can we can we have that you've stopped doing all these bad things? Yeah. And and I think one of the challenges a going to be the reform, and then b going to be able to show that you actually you got your act together and you're now clean. And until you can solve those two, many of your big 
tech companies are going to be at a competitive disadvantage and they're going to be screaming for this reform. Well, I think that, you know, General uh, Mattis said in his book about Trump and the United States is that you need alliances. And I think your point about trust and executing together without alliances, it really doesn't work. So unless there's some sort of real alliance, like understanding that there's going to be some teamwork here, <laughs> I don't think it's going to go anywhere. So it'll otherwise, otherwise it'll be continue to be siloed and network based, right? So to the village point, if if uh, if the if TikTok can become a massively successful app, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're surveilling. So there, and then we have to decide that if they're going to put up with that or no. That's not my decision, but that's what's going on here. It's like, what is TikTok? Is it good or bad? Amazon sent out an email and they retracted it. That's because it went public. I guarantee you that they're talking about that at Amazon. Like, why would we want infiltration by the Chinese? And I'm speculating. I have no data. I'm just saying, you know, you, an email goes out and then they pull it back. Oh, we didn't mean to send that. Really? Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, is good trial balloon's good. There, you always spying. want a good trial balloon out there. Yeah, so. this, yeah exactly. There's some spying going on. So um, this is the reality. So, so John, you were talking about 5G, and I think, you know, the rollout of 5G, you know, the battle between Cisco and Huawei, you just have to look at it this way. Would you rather have the U.S. spy on you? Or would you rather have China? And, and that's really your binary choice at this moment. And you know yes. both is happening. And, and so the question is, which one is better? Like the one that you're in alliance with, the one that you're not in alliance with, the one that wants to bury you and decimate your country and steal all your secrets and then commercialize them or the one that kind of does it, but doesn't really do it explicitly. So you got to choose. Yeah. <laughs> or you can say, no, we're going to create our own standard for 5G and kick both out. I mean, it's that's an option. Straightforward, it's probably not as straightforward a question as, as, uh, or an answer to that question as you would say. Because if we were to fast forward 50 years, I, I would argue that China is going to be the largest trading nation in the world. Um, I believe that China is going to have the upper hand on some, many of these technologies. Um, and therefore, why would we not want to use some of their innovation and their, some of their technology? Why would we not actually be more orientated around trading with them than we might be with the US? I think the, the, the US is throwing its weight around at this moment in time. In, and, but if we were to fast forward, I think if looking in the long term, if I had to put my money on a Huawei or some of its competitors, I think given its level of investment um, in research and, and whatever, I, I think the longer, be, the better long term bet is Huawei. No, no, actually, you guys need to pick a camp. It's a village again. You have to pick a camp. You can be with both guys. The global village. All oh, right. So, so we have to go with the guys that have been spying on us. Well, which well, how do you know the Chinese <laughs> haven't been spying on you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy you find a backdoor in the Huawei equipment and you show it to us. We'll take them to task on it. But don't start um, bullying us into making decisions based on what ifs. <laughs> I don't think I, I'm not, I, I'm not qualified to represent the U.S., but what I, what I would want to say is that, I mean, if you look at the dynamics of what's going on in China, and we've been studying that as well in terms of the geopolitical aspects of what happens yeah. in technology, um, they have to do what they're doing right now because in 20 years, their population dynamics go like this, right, because yeah. of the one-child policy, and they won't have the ability to go out and, and, and fight for those same resources where they are. So, so, the, so what they're doing makes sense from a country perspective and country policy, but, but I think they're going to look like Japan in 20 years, right? Because the xenophobia, the lack of immigration, the lack of inside stuff coming in, an aging population, I mean, those, those are all factors that slow down your economy in the long run. And, and the lack of bringing new people in for ideas, I mean, that's, that's part of it, their closed system. And so I, I think, you know, the long-term dynamics of every closed system is that they tend to fail versus open systems. So I'm not sure. They may have better technology along the way, but I, I think a lot of us are probably in the camp now figuring that we're not going to aid and abet them um, in, in that sense to get there. You're conflicting a country with a company. I didn't, I didn't say that China had, a, had necessarily everything rosy in its future. It'll be a big, it'll be a bigger economy and it'll be a bigger trading for but don't, and it's, but it's got its problems with the one, one child policy and the, the repercussions of that. But that is not one and the and, same thing as Huawei. Among, I think Huawei is a massively innovative company that is that has got a massive lead, certainly in 5G technology, and may continue to maintain a lead into yeah. 6G and, and beyond. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get, Huawei's get, done a great job on the 5G side. I, I oh, don't yeah. disagree with that. I mean, they're ahead in many aspects compared to the U.S., and they're already working on the 6G technologies yeah. as well, and the rollouts have yeah. been further ahead. So that, that's definitely And they got a great backer, too, the finance of the country yeah. china okay guys let's let's <laughs> let's wrap up let's wrap up um 
this segment. Thanks for everyone's time. Final thoughts, just each of you on this core issue of the news that we discussed and the impact that was the conversation. What's the core issue? What should people think about? What's your solution? What's your opinion of how this plays out? Just final final statements. We'll start with Bill, Ray, Shabit, and JD. All, all I'm going to ask, all I'm going to ask is stop spying on us. Treat us equally. Treat us like the allies that we are. And then I think we've got a bright future together. Right. I I would say that Bill's right in that aspect in terms of how security agreements work. I think that we needed to be more explicit about those. I can't represent the U.S. government, but I think the larger issue is really how do we view privacy and how we do the trade-offs between security and convenience uh, and you know what's required for personalization and companies that are built on data. So, so the further, the sooner we get to those kind of rules and understanding of what's possible, what's a consensus between different countries and companies, I think the better off we will all be as a society. Yeah, I, I believe the, the, the most important kind of independence is economic independence, like economically sound parties dictate the terms. That's what U.S. is doing. And and the smaller countries have to live with it or pick the other bigger player. Number two, in this case, is China, as John said earlier. I think um, I, I also, as he said, it's a, it's a fine balance between national security and the privacy. You can't have, you have to have that strike, have, you have to strike that balance because the rogue actors are sitting in your country and across the boundaries of the countries, right? So it's not that FISA is being fought by Europeans only. Our internal people are fighting that too. Like how, when you're mining our data, uh, like what are you using for? Like uh, I, I get concerned too, like uh, when you can use that data against me if, if, I have, if you have some data against me, right? So. I think it's the fine balance between security and and uh, and, and uh, privacy. We have to strike that. Awesome, JD. Um, I'll include uh, a little fact check. Uh, fact, fact check. At the moment, China is the largest economy. The European Union is the second largest economy, followed directly by the USA. It's it's a very small difference. And I recommend that these two big parties behind the largest economy start to collaborate and start to do that eye to eye. Because if you want to balance the economical and manufacturing power of China, you cannot do that as being number two and number three. You have to join up forces. And that starts with um, sticking with the treaties that you signed. And that has not happened in the past almost four years. So let's go back to the table Let's work on rules where from both sides, the rights and the privileges are properly reflected and then do the most important thing, stick to them. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And I think, you know, I would say that these young kids in high school and college, they need to come up and solve the problems. This is gonna be a new generational shift where the geopolitical landscape will change radically. You mentioned the top three there and new, new alliances, new kinds of reimagination has to be there. And from America's standpoint, I'll just say that I'd like to see lawmakers have, instead of a LinkedIn handle, a GitHub handle, you know, when they all go out on campaign, talk about what code they've written. So I think having a technical background or some sort of knowledge of computer science and how the internet works, uh, with sociology and societal impact will be critical for citizenships to advance. So, you know, rather than a lawyer, right? So maybe there's some law involved. I don't mean to critical all lawyers, but today most people are lawyers in America, politics. But show me a GitHub handle on a congressman and a senator, I'd be impressed. So that's what we need. Ray, you want to say Thanks, something? Guys. I, I wanted to say something because I, I thought the I thought the U.S. economy was 21 trillion, the EU was sitting at about 16, and China was sitting about 14. But okay, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, you need to do your math, man. And we went over our, our 30 minute think, time. We can do an hour with you guys. So you're so yeah. good. Okay, don't worry. No, go get it in there. We got something to say. No, 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 I don't think it's immaterial. The exact size of the commit. I think that uh, we're, we're better off collaborating on even and fair terms. We're all better we're, off collaborating. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but collaboration has to be on equal and fair terms, you know. <laughs> How do you define fair? Good point. Uh, fair and balanced, you know, well, you know we, we, get the new... We, we did define fair. We, we, yeah. we struck a treaty uh, yeah. that absolutely defined it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then one side didn't stick to it. Well, we will leave it right there and we'll follow up and great conversation. <laughs> Gentlemen, you guys are good. Thank you.